What are we learning in general about telemedicine? We're improving quality of care, which shocked me. I just was hoping for equivalence. Just show me that it's just as good and I'll do it. But what I'm learning is it's improving quality of care. Welcome to this episode of Hearing Health Today. I'm Craig Sharp. Today we'll continue our theme on telemedicine and hear from another expert who will give her perspective on how clinics can use telemedicine in practice and also provide insight into what's in store for the future of hearing health care, both challenges and opportunities. This is a podcast for hearing health professionals. If you are a person with hearing loss or a member of the general public, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. Joining us now is Dr. Allison Beaver, researcher and audiologist from Rocky Mountain Ear Center in Denver, Colorado, and instructor for the Institute of Cochlear Implant Training. Allison, thanks for joining us today. Where are you speaking to us from? So I'm speaking to you from Denver, Colorado, and I work in a private practice here in Denver. Um, Out of curiosity, are you uh, still practicing during the COVID-19 pandemic? Have you had to shut your offices at all? Are you still treating patients? So during the entire pandemic thus far, we've stayed open. We have largely seen more urgent cases. I think the hospital is probably happy to have us here on campus. We're not actually in the Mm. hospital. We're in a medical office building attached to a hospital in Denver at Swedish. And uh, it's kept patients from having to go into the hospital for bloody ear canals. And, yeah. you know, we're still doing surgery with our tumor patients. And so I have continued to see implant patients that f- are off the air, are struggling with sound. Because mm-hmm. our office has been open, th- some of our patients have come in. And so are you seeing patients both in person and remotely as well? I am seeing more patients remotely than I've ever seen before, and I've always been a huge proponent of telemedicine, but I'm seeing significantly more since the beginning of March. Someone told me that you have a long history in telemedicine with audiology, so I'd love to learn a little bit more about that and when you started doing telemedicine or teleaudiology and how things have changed uh, in the years since you started. So I would love to talk about that because I'm very (laughs) passionate about telemedicine. My interest was first picked about six years ago, and I maybe even longer than that, I would probably say 10 years ago, but not in a very traditional sense. I was seeing patients that lived in Wyoming that were anywhere from two to eight hours away from our office. Some of our patients couldn't come in. They were elderly. They couldn't drive. One of the moms I worked with, she had a child with an implant. She had epilepsy, so she couldn't drive. So Mm -hmm. I made the decision about 10 years ago with my surgeon's blessing to travel to them and set up remote oh. satellite clinics. Wow, so, so you were traveling from Denver to Wyoming to do the, okay, wow. That's, how far of a drive is that? So to go to Casper, it's about four and a half to five hours. Okay. It's not too far, but it's kind of a central location in Wyoming. So patients from all over Wyoming would travel to Casper. Mm. And that continued for a number of years. It, it was kind of a crazy thing, but As people found out I was doing that, they were very excited to start thinking about an implant because now this idea that they wouldn't have to travel to Denver entered their head. They heard Mm -hmm. that an audiologist was going there to see patients, but it really became a um, kind of an unsustainable model. And I could talk more about that and some of the studies that we did as a clinic to show that telemedicine was very effective but that kind of is what first picked my interest and it did become kind of unsustainable but the driving to Wyoming really gave me a lot of respect for how hard it is for people yeah you know like you do it one of the times I remember driving out to Fort Collins I forgot one cable that I needed so I had to turn around and come back and you know it was awful it only happened one time in 10 years but um it it you you have a whole new respect when you're the one doing the driving and if Mm -hmm. if i had to go to a doctor's appointment and not just at the activation but then two weeks later and then you know a month later and then three months later i would be like this is a pain and then I wait in the waiting room and I can't find a place to park and my kid's crying. Yeah. And, you know, I can't imagine any other doctor's appointment where I have to make that kind of a commitment. And why does and it have to be that way? Why does it have to be that way? 
So, so you were traveling back and forth to Wyoming um, to do these pop-up clinics and then that sort of morphed into more of a remote telemedicine session yes. where instead of traveling. Okay. So do you still travel to Wyoming to do any of those first appointments or is it all done I, remotely? I do or- still travel there um, twice a year. Okay. But really, um, more and more people are seeing me through telehealth. Yeah. So what, what really happened was about six years ago, Christine said, how are you going to continue to see all of these patients twice a year? And my clinics were slammed when I would go to Wyoming. Mm-hmm. And it, it was starting to be that I needed to get there earlier and start like at 7.30 in the morning and work till 6 without a lunch hour because oh, I, I just I couldn't see everybody. And so we decided to start investigating how we could be using telemedicine to be remotely programming our CI patients. So we had a... Um, a facilitator, basically she was a fourth year audiology graduate student, yeah. um, helped me with this project. And the first phase of the study, we um, we did a lot of testing with an implant in the box and figured out if there was a delay. And she basically traveled to two sites. One was in Cheyenne, again, about two hours away, and one was in Casper, about five hours away. Okay. And I would see these patients at that center. But I was still in Denver. So she had the computer. She would get them hooked up. But I would do all the programming from here. So that's basically how it started. So you started with like a hub and spoke model where there was, okay, so you had an audiologist on the other end and then you in Denver. Okay, interesting. And and when we did that phase of the study, we had all of our patients fill out a survey to see what they thought of it. Mm -hmm. Could they hear me clearly? Could they see me clearly? How much money did they save? How much time did they save? Were they satisfied with the delivery of services? Would they do it again? And they're like, there were, I can't remember all of them, but there were multiple questions on the survey. And it was absolutely shocking to me how many people preferred it. And I really thought that people would miss the face to face contact, Mm -hmm. that they would miss seeing me in person not that that's exciting but there's something about a personal touch and yeah. and doing it face to face we're face to face of course um when we do it through telemedicine but i just felt like they would miss it and yeah um i was really surprised that largely people did not miss it especially when they had to consider at what cost seeing yeah. me in person um afforded them when they realized I have to get a hotel when I come to Denver. I have to take off time from work. Um, Denver traffic is horrible. Trying to find a parking spot is very cumbersome. So when people were factoring that in, we just had an overwhelmingly positive response. In fact, we were we asked all of our patients to tell us if their satisfaction with telemedicine was very satisfactory, satisfactory, whether they were neutral about it, whether they, it was a dissatisfying experience or whether they were very mm-hmm. dissatisfied. And not a single person was neutral or dissatisfied. Oh, interesting. Everyone Everybody was satisfied or very was satisfied. Thrilled. And in fact, the only comment people had was, could you do this from our home? Because yeah, why okay. am I traveling from, you know, a remote part of Wyoming to go to Casper? Mm-hmm. Like, this was great. Why can't you just do this from our home? So we did a second phase of the study. And I'm sure lots of them were in their pajamas from the waist down. <laughs> yes. I've been doing a lot of that recently. So, <laughs> Right? And um, drinking their coffee and making themselves comfortable. So the second phase, we saw um, roughly the same number of patients, but they didn't have to travel. And um, it was the same setup for me, of course. And that was extremely positively received by all of the recipients of that study. The subjects in that study were thrilled. So that's kind of where it started. But for that particular study, we weren't looking at performance. We were just looking at, did it feel the same for them? Could they, it was a feasibility study, exactly. I guess fast forward six years, what does it look like today? How are you treating patients remotely? Um, Well, there's probably one step in between where we are today. I think that model by itself was great. 
to know the patients were satisfied was great, but I think there are probably a lot of clinicians that would have said, I'm not okay with that unless you can prove to me that they perform the same. Right. I, so that's one thing I was wondering. We, we often hear in the audiology community, telemedicine sounds great, but I'm not convinced that it's as good as an in-person appointment. Right. I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that. As you sort of went through the evolution of developing a practice where you're able to serve patients remotely, how did you address that challenge? Our office um, participated along with a number of other big centers in the United States. We were okay. part of an IDE, FDA, multi-center study to show that performance was equivalent. And we didn't know if it would be. And how did you and measure so performance? We measured performance based on their CNC word score, okay. which is kind of a gold standard in our field. Yep. And so um, what we saw was there was not no difference in their outcome measures on a CNC word task, whether we saw them in the clinic face-to-face -face, or whether we saw them through telemedicine. And I think that that was a pivotal piece. And I, yeah. I, I believe that that piece was really instrumental in getting the Food and Drug Administration in the United States to approve telemedicine for cochlear implant programming. Was that over the course of six months or a year, two years? Like, what did that look like? The study took a few months to complete, yep. but this all happened quite a while ago. So this happened in November of 2017 that the study ended and yep. the Food and Drug Administration approved telemedicine for cochlear implant recipients and for programming of their devices. So um, it's kind of shocking to me that we got the FDA approval in our country almost three years ago. Yeah. And as clinicians, we're not running with this tool. Well, let me ask you the question you posed back to me. So what do you think telemedicine will look like in audiology in a few years' time? What it looks like now is... is um, really, really different than the models I described earlier. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's relatively easy. Um, more and more patients are familiar with platforms that would allow them to see me face-to-face. -face. They're not in the same shipping? room with me. We ship a tablet. So this is how it works now. A patient contacts me, and this was happening very frequently over the last two months. They say, I don't want to come in. I'm nervous yeah. about coming in. Um, I know I want to see you, and I know I need to have my, my processor reprogrammed, but I'm nervous about coming in. So we say, no problem. Your appointment's not for three weeks. We ship them a tablet. We ship them the um, pod. Yeah, we ship okay. them a cable that would go with their particular device. And once they receive it, they call us, confirm that they have it, and we're... we're uh, we send directions with, with the tablet, so they have to connect to their internet, and they okay. have a process that they go through. So they're ready for their appointment. We call them a few minutes before their appointment. Mm -hmm. They get on the platform that we've agreed to use, and I literally step them through connecting their processor to the cable, which is attached to the pod, which is attached to the tablet, and I basically open up the software and take control of their tablet. And everything that happens from that point on is identical to how it would happen if they were in the same room with me. I'm just taking over control of that tablet and then giving them instructions and they're able to um, follow along. Do you find that um, from beginning to end, are these appointments about the same as what you would do in an in-person clinic setting? Are they shorter, longer? Just out of curiosity, like what this looks like from a time perspective. Surprisingly, they're very similar in, in length. Okay. And that's for um, a couple of different reasons. One of the reasons is because we don't test them in the booth afterwards. Okay. So mm -hmm. we save a little time at the end. Sure. But it may take 15 minutes to get them up and running with their technology. And occasionally I might have someone and it's a total disaster. Yeah. And so <laughs> for 45 minutes, we don't get connected. And the last 15 minutes, I'm doing some helpful things. But I may say to them, we're going to do this again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen very often, but occasionally, probably 5% of the time, that happens. 
But the, the majority of the time, it takes the same hour long appointment to, to do the visit. But it's somewhat cumbersome because we have to ship them a tablet. I'm curious, do you have patients in Denver that could feasibly come to the clinic or maybe even other parts of Colorado that aren't quite as far afield as Wyoming, but choose to have a remote encounter instead? You certainly hear about it more when distance is involved. And mm -hmm. one of our patients from Wyoming estimated it saved them $1,000. Oh, man. So it's That's... huge for distance. Yeah. But yes, even for someone who doesn't have the travel expenses, this is a very, very attractive option. And then with yeah. the pandemic, it became a safety issue. So that opened up a whole other area where patients were saying, I want to do this through telemedicine. I don't feel safe walking into an office right now. Well, yeah, that was another question I had because, you know, who knows what this will look like in um, six months, 12 months. But if a vaccine doesn't come for quite a while, I think it could be not ideal for folks in vulnerable age populations uh, to come into the clinic. Do you anticipate using this model to treat some of those patients that might be uh, in a demographic that uh, should shelter in place for longer than, um, let's say, the next three months? Absolutely. And one of the things that was interesting to me, we activated a lot of recipients in February and beginning of March. But the first two weeks of March, we saw six recipients, about six recipients, all over the age of 80. Wow. And okay. one of the things that's really exciting is how many 80 and 90 year olds are looking at this technology, which would be a yeah. whole other podcast. Right? <laughs> I we know. to see these 90 year olds. <laughs> yeah. But, um, they, they, especially given this pandemic and those that have compromised immunity and other health mm -hmm. concerns, do not want to be traveling to be programmed in the office. Yeah. So they, um, they're very interested in telemedicine and we're just offering it to people out of the box. So when I see a patient for a CI evaluation now, I tell those patients, we can be doing your follow-up through telemedicine. And the patients that have any concerns at all that were recently activated have requested it. In some other clinics throughout the world, I've seen clinicians start telemedicine in their practice, but they're really hesitant to enroll folks in a telemedicine program if they are, let's say, over 80, over 90. Was there a barrier to overcome in terms of technology adoption, or did it go much better than you could have ever anticipated? It went much better than I would have anticipated. However, we usually ask that there be another person in the room um, mm -hmm. for a couple reasons. In case they have a problem hearing what I'm saying, not everybody mm -hmm. is, um, especially if they're newly activated, at a place where speech is really clear. This technology is amazing. Most people take off with it. But yeah. sometimes we have poorer than expected performers. And mm -hmm. so to have someone there that can help intervene if they don't understand an instruction. But in addition to that, it's been helpful for them to navigate the internet. Um, yeah. I have some 80 year olds that haven't needed help and some that have needed help. And during this pandemic, I've had their 60 year old daughter or son mm -hmm. be extremely helpful in getting them hooked up to the technology. My vision for the future is yeah. that there'd be no tablet that we'd ship. Like, if we could make it even easier for patients, like I envision in six years from now that they could just download the software themselves from a cloud. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't need an interface pod. There'd be a way they could just interface and connect through the computer somehow. There wouldn't even, they could wirelessly connect to their software without needing the pod or cables. It just works, I it guess. It just like, works. So what do you have patients who are bimodal? We do. That would be a second issue where you would have to see them in the clinic. But again, I don't think that's that far away. When I, when I do travel to Wyoming, I have a, um, a NOAA link and I can, I can take care of my bodal, bimodal patients when I travel. But yeah. I haven't been able to take care of my bimodal patients through telemedicine. 
Yeah, so not they yet. They say, okay. "Can you adjust my hearing aid?" I can't. I can't do that. But even that is changing very, very quickly. The hearing aid manufacturers are all providing ways for us to do it through telemedicine. So uh, I wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier. So you said that you are shipping a tablet and a cable, a pod to the patient in order to facilitate the telemedicine encounter. How do you manage the logistics, I guess, on your end of like shipping and receiving those tablets? Was that something that you guys had to adapt to as a, as a clinic and figure out how that worked? So we have an administrative assistant, which I would highly recommend. I don't have to load the tablet. So she has to strip it down. Of course, during the pandemic, it has to be cleaned. Mm -hmm. It has to be sterilized. But also because of HIPAA and different countries might have different obstacles they would face, we have to strip it. It can't have any other patient files on it. Yeah. So yeah, that when I open it up remotely, I open up the software, the only file that appears, the only CDX file they see is their own. Yeah. Um, and so th she takes care of all of that. She tracks it. She tells, she, she takes care of all of that. I literally show up at my desk and I, I am actually thinking, where's my patient? And um, I get a call from our front desk that says, your patient's waiting on line two and they're wondering why you haven't contacted them because you're seeing them through telemedicine. And I'm like, <laughs> yes. oh, yeah, right. Okay. Right. Yeah, here we go. One thing that I find interesting about the um, telemedicine during this pandemic is that it's really accelerated adoption sort of across the board um, in a whole bunch of therapeutic areas within healthcare. Do you have any thoughts on what we could learn from how telemedicine is being used in other therapeutic areas in terms of best practice that we might be able to bring into the hearing health community? A couple of things. In watching the speech and language pathologists working with telemedicine, yeah. they do it so easily. Yeah. They do it so easily. So we have to get away from the equipment. It, yeah. The equipment needs to be more accessible. That's something we can learn from other disciplines. Sure. Um, whether Cochlear could provide it as something they could pick like an accessory, access to a tablet, the cochlear shipped to them whenever they needed it, whether it was something that was provided in a cloud, like a link to the software. We've got mm -hmm. to get away from the equipment because it would be hard to have enough tablets on hand to take care of the number of people I'm currently seeing through telemedicine. In other words, they're having to wait till our tablets come back before I can send another tablet out. Yeah, okay. So there's some so limitation. Equipment's, of, the mm -hmm. equipment's a, a limitation, and we can learn from other disciplines how much easier it would be if we weren't bogged down by the equipment. But the other thing that we can really learn is how to be better educators. So I feel like our speech and language pathologist friends have done a really good job of engaging the parents that they're working with to to become better aware of how to be therapists themselves. Yeah. So one of the things I feel like we can learn as clinicians and that I'm learning through telemedicine is how much patients are interested in seeing the screen, how much they want to learn about their maps, yeah. how they can see it. It's interactive in a way it wasn't before. I feel like we have a lot that we need to do to be better educators of our recipients about, like I said, their maps, their equipment, the technology in general. It kind of reminds me, I guess, of the adoption of electronic health records where, you know, for a while, physicians were behind a computer, like charting it about a patient, sort of not including them in the encounter. But now you're seeing a lot of clinicians sort of involve the patient and sort of what uh, that creation of a health record looks like. Is, is that, you know, a model, I guess, uh, we can recreate in audiology as well. With Absolutely. And even the questions that they should be asking when do they need reprogramming? I feel like we could be educating our recipients better about um, when they need intervention. Like I feel like that's yeah. a piece that's missing yeah. or that we somehow have. You know, you just have these routine appointments that are scheduled. And sometimes patients will still say to me, why am I coming in again? Yeah, because yes. they're doing so great, they don't really see the purpose. And so that makes me realize, maybe it's just myself personally, but I've heard other clinicians say the same thing, that the, that the patient's confused about why they need to keep coming back. 
Yeah. Okay. And maybe they don't need to come back. I think sometimes we make a mistake and assume someone just needs to come back because it's been six months. Maybe they don't. Yeah. One of the things I think I'm learning through telemedicine is that sometimes we don't need to, to make changes. Yeah. It, and do you find, I guess, sort of the, the opposite is, is true as well, that there are a lot of patients who maybe should come back every six months or every year, but don't? And is, is telemedicine a way to sort of reach out to those folks that are lost to follow up? Absolutely. We're usually pretty on top of, of the patients who haven't come back in, but we miss people. And yeah. usually when clinicians find out about it is when the patient is due for an upgrade and they still have something old. They've missed one whole new generation of devices. And you think, oh my gosh, it's been that long since you've been seen. And they're not hearing well. They don't have a... Um, they don't have... They haven't changed their microphone protectors. They don't have a way of doing a listening check because maybe they live by themselves and don't have anyone yeah. that can check their equipment and they should have been in years ago and yeah. so I think if they could see that this was an option you know it's interesting to me when you ask them why haven't you come back what do those patients say and quite frequently it's the patients that have distance issues that have health issues that have finance issues yeah. that have mm -hmm. um they're concerned about the traffic like they're all issues that telemedicine would address yeah, yeah. and you know one of the things that that that, that, that you make me think of when you ask that question is what are we learning in general about telemedicine and one of the things i think we're learning is we're improving quality of care which shocked me i just yeah. was hoping for equivalence like just show me that it's just as good and i'll do it but what I'm learning is it's improving quality of care in, in two ways is it improving quality of care, and they're huge. The first, we've all belabored this point for years. We talk about under penetration of the CI market. We talk about this all the time. We say mm -hmm. patients that could be benefiting from this technology are not getting it. But why aren't they getting it? Some of the patients aren't getting it because they've heard there's a lot of follow-up, and they don't want to do the follow-up visits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I, I told you in the beginning, when we were traveling to the hub and spoke model, the, the, mm -hmm. the satellite offices, if you will, in Wyoming, people started coming out of the woodwork and they started coming out of the woodwork because they said, we've heard you travel to Casper, so we want to <laughs> get a cochlear implant now because we don't want to ever go to Denver. Well, I'm sorry, but you have to come to see the doctor. He, he won't travel there. Um, and you do have to have surgery here, but we can make a lot of this, the follow-up visits happen through telemedicine now. But the second way we're improving care, so we've not only improved access, but the second way is exactly what you said. We're missing these people to follow up. They yeah. haven't come in for seven years. They don't want to travel. Their maps are terrible. Their equipment's falling apart. Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw a patient recently that hadn't been seen in five years. He's elderly. His daughter brought him in. He couldn't. I was typing to him. He had a map that really needed to be changed. To be frank, he hadn't been he hadn't been seen since three months after his activation. Wow. And why okay. why was that? It was like what were the barri barriers Travel. preventing him from coming in? Travel, yeah. mm -hmm. health. He's in a nursing home. She has to take yeah. off time off work. They it finally got to be so frustrating. They just did it. But. Yeah. But and the last time I saw them, five years ago, we weren't doing as many. Like oh, my interest yeah. was getting there, but mm -hmm. I was in the infancy stages of telemedicine. I wasn't telling every patient I worked with, "This is an option for you. Just keep this in mind." We also do telemedicine, so yeah. I wasn't telling every patient. I was telling. It was kind of what you said earlier that it's not just the people that live eight hours away. It's yeah. people that just don't. They, they're in bad health. They don't want to have to park or valet park or find a parking spot and walk a block or yeah. they don't, they don't want to do that. My doctor lives a mile away and I don't like to go. Right. <laughs> so I like, our, you know. our parking structure yeah. is so bad. Our patients don't want to come that live 20 minutes away. They'd rather, <laughs> yeah. they'd rather do it from home. I was really hoping this podcast would so 
inspire people that clinicians that aren't offering this to patients like to offer it to pay all of their patients and they're not going to start there but they're going to end up there they're going to start with choosing the patients that this makes sense for and they're going to yeah. get experience with it and they're going to see oh my gosh i could be doing this oh, i could be doing this for this patient that does live 20 minutes from the office but is in a nursing home they yeah. don't have to come in a lot of clinics around the world are um, thinking about starting telemedicine programs now, partially out of necessity, but but partially because uh, it's becoming more common just sort of in, in healthcare at large. What advice do you have for uh, a clinic maybe similar to yours that's somewhere else in the world that's thinking about starting up a program? If you were to give advice, what would it be? Do it. It is so much easier than you think. Since this pandemic started, once a week, twice a week, sometimes three times a week, I get an email from a clinician somewhere in the United States saying, can you tell me how to do this? Yeah. And it's not rocket science. If you can do a Zoom meeting, you can do this. So yeah. um, I, I think one of the obstacles that's keeping clinicians from doing it is they would like a little bit more of a step-by-step. -step. Yeah. And the other advice I would have is try it in your own office. And then you'll be a believer. So if yeah. you have just two rooms in your office, Try load, next door. <laughs> load the software on a tablet, yeah. have another clinician take that tablet into a conference room, attach it to a pod and processor, and do it in your office. And when you see how easy this is, you're going to say, oh my gosh, why didn't I do this sooner? Cause yeah, it, that's... yeah, but I think it's like what you don't know is what keeps you. It it's it it, it keeps you feeling paralyzed. You think, well, I, I I don't know how to do it, um, and somehow it's this big unknown. You just have to do it once, and you're like, you get excited about the possibilities. But I think you also become mobilized all of a sudden because you realize how easy it is. I like your advice. That's a really low risk way. Yeah, it's so low risk. Um, and the other thing I would say to clinicians is my kids, even though they respect me and love me and they're wonderful daughters, I'm sure think that I am stupid. They don't really, <laughs> but technology, they'll grab my phone from me and go, oh, you know, like, like, okay. and they've been doing this since they were teenagers. Like, yeah. now they're all young adults and they're very poised and, and respectful and kind. But I'm sure they think <laughs> you are ridiculous. If I can figure this out and make this work, anybody can make this work. Yeah, that's great advice. I think the mystery has to be taken out of this. Yeah. And if they can do that, they're going to be successful. Well, Allison, thanks for joining the podcast. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you, and I appreciate you um, connecting with us uh, after hours from Denver. It was a pleasure to be here, and I really, truly hope that people are as excited about telemedicine as I am. And thank you for listening to today's podcast. If you enjoyed it, please make sure you press the subscribe button and give us a rating and a review. If there's a particular topic you'd like us to cover, please mention it in your review. We'd love to hear from you. You can find all the links to what was discussed in today's podcast in the description and stay tuned for our next episode. In the meantime, stay safe. Just a quick reminder, the views of the interviewees in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of Cochlear Limited or its subsidiaries. This material is intended for health professionals. If you are a consumer, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. Outcomes may vary and your health professional will advise about the factors which could affect your outcome.